why I said a smart man learns from his own mistakes, a wise man learns from other people's mistakes, but a fool doesn't learn anything. You're going to know. I'm going to share the truth with you. Amen. How about that? <laughs>
I was 14, I grew real tall. I got to be really tall. And so I, I you know, I pick up a basketball. I think I was like 13. I picked up a basketball for the first time. I was the tallest guy on the team and I was the worst player. I was really <laughs> bad. You grew too fast. <laughs> yeah. I had no skill level, you know. And um, so when I went to when I went to Northwestern, I wasn't even gonna play football, to be quite honest with you. I didn't even like football. I really didn't. And I wasn't expecting to be on the varsity team or any of that kind of stuff. And uh, the coach made me come out. You know, back then the coaches had um, a lot more power than they have now. <laughs> you know, if a coach told you to do something, you did it. The coach called me and he said, uh, son, uh, how come you weren't at football practice? And I said, uh, well, I wasn't going to play football. He said, who told you you weren't playing football? <laughs> I said, well, he said, and he said, so, um, if you're not at practice tomorrow at 7.30, 7.30, I'll be at your house. And, uh, I mean, 7.31, he said, I'll be at your house. And, he, and they had this thing called a board of education, which was a, a, a wooden board with holes in it. It was a paddle. <laughs> and if you didn't do what they told you, you had to bend over, touch your toes, man. And you learned very, very quickly. So, you know, um, I played football. I played basketball. I wanted to play in the NBA. And I probably was known more around Baltimore as a basketball player than I was as a football player. But, you know, um, because, you know, I had the ability, I didn't know it. You know, I just kept playing and playing and, and look what happened. Yeah. Wow. You know, I, I miss men like that. I got to be honest. We we didn't have the game systems. We didn't have the technology back then. But yeah. there were guys like that that once in a while saw something in one of us and said, yeah. you got to do it. And, okay, we did it. Just did it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you said something, Pastor Rob, because um, – the coach saw something in me I didn't see in myself. I had a dream. I did. I mean, like a lot of kids, I want to play in the NBA. I want to be a fireman. I want to be a police officer. You know, we have these dreams. And I didn't know how to get there, nor was it like, was I really that committed at the time? It was just a dream. And uh, this guy, he saw something in me, and uh, he took me under his wing, and he taught me, you know, how to be a better athlete and a better person, how to respect myself, how to be a leader. And we just need more like that. You know, examples of he's a godly man, examples of godly men. And and he, he was a white coach and he coached an all black team in the inner city. And, and we all respected him. We didn't necessarily like him. They're like a lot of guys didn't like him, but everybody respected him. Right. Well, I think um, I tell my kids that a lot. I said it's not about uh, especially when you play sports, you know, you don't have to be popular out there. You don't have to make friends out there, but you do care that people respect your gameplay. Yeah. If you're yeah. going to football, you know, yeah. but, uh, but then you make friends. We always made friends anyway, but yeah. That, yeah. So you were, uh, was it, uh, was Northwestern predominantly white school, black school? How, how did that work it, out? It a, well, um, it was a black school. So it started out, it, it was a pretty new school in Baltimore city. Uh, it was a predominantly black school. We may have had five, six white kids in the school, even though it was in a white neighborhood. Right. Wow. Yeah. And, yeah. And so, um, you know, uh, but we had this coach, man, uh, Mr. Russell. Then we had a, a pretty strong black JV coach that everybody liked. And, you know, you have the racial thing. Remember, this is in the mid-70s. Sure, You know, sure. had the racial thing going on. And uh, and so uh, this, the black coach wanted me to play on JV with him. And I wanted to. I begged the coach. Hey, coach, let me play on JV because all my friends were on JV. Yeah. The, the 10th graders, the only ones that were on Vossi was me and Ray Snell. And Ray <laughs> Snell and I, you know. <laughs> And, and, and it was funny. And so that was kind of our bond, you know, how we continued to bond because, you know, we were here. We didn't know that, like, we were, like, really good athletes. I mean, you, you like to think you are. But when you start getting out your neighborhood and you're playing with a team that's a statewide champion, they have won, they have won two championships before we even got there. So it wasn't like we came and took them to the next level. We were joining a, a thing that they already had. And um, so it, 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 was, it, it was different. It was interesting. And then – being in Northwestern or being in Baltimore, that was all black, and you know, I went to college in Wisconsin. That was a little bit of a difference, you know. Yeah, I remember you said, uh, "I went to Wisconsin. It was Lily White." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was, um, you know, I'm sure you got. I, I, now, what year was that? Well, you, well, give me those years so everybody knows what years you were there at Wisconsin. So I went to Wisconsin in, in 1976, right? Okay. So I got to Wisconsin in 1976, and, and and it was it was really weird because, you know, I always was a good student. But I, I, you know, I probably had heard of Wisconsin pro probably before that, but not really. You know, you just don't pay attention to it because you, your world is your world that you live in. That's you right. Know, as a kid, 
Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I went up, I went up to Wisconsin, and and it was different. And a lot of guys came up there, especially came from that came from the inner city and stuff. They became homesick, stuff like that. And 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 the music was different. Now, mind you, I got to Wisconsin in 1976, so you know it, it was different. And the year before I got there, they had burnt down the um, they had a black student union center up there, and they had burned it down, and they had all this you know racial tension going on. Sure. You know, when you're an athlete, a lot of times you don't experience that. We're sheltered from that a lot. Yeah. And so I, I didn't really experience it. And then, you know, I played football and basketball. Nobody was doing what I was doing. And I'm not bragging. I'm just saying the reality was that I was on a football team and a basketball team. Yeah. And that was that was just not normal at that level. Yeah. A lot of us did it in high school, but most of us can't do it when we go to the next level, especially in the Big Ten. Sure. Well, that was a lot of – Big competition, Smash Mouth football back then. Yeah, um, and basketball. So and, and and so I played against the number one draft pick in the NBA all my years. That every year I played basketball. The first year we had a guy named Kent Benson at Indiana, and Bobby Knight was the coach. Oh wow! Right? Yeah. And so we beat them down there. The next year, the number one pick was a guy named Michael Thompson, Clay Thompson, that played with the Golden State Warriors. His dad. He was the number one pick. The third year, the number one pick was Magic Johnson from Michigan State. And then the fourth year was Joe Barry Carroll at Purdue. So I had a chance to play against some really good competition. And yeah. I mean, played, competed, and did well. Well, you played against the La Creme de la Creme of players. And it was then great. Football, let's see, Archie Griffin time frame. Archie Griffin was there. Had? They had a guy named Tom Cousineau that was the number one pick for the Buffalo Bills. Um, you had, uh, uh, man, who else? Ohio State had. Ohio, Michigan had, uh, they had Rick Leach. Um, Rick Leach was a great football player. Um, Butch Woolfolk, um, Curtis Gray. I mean, it was a lot of guys that I'm talking about really good high draft picks. You played, I mean, you played you played against a number, a, a number of number one draft picks. Something that people don't really know that one of the best baseball players ever was a guy named Kurt Gibson. You remember Kurt Gibson? I know the name. He played, he played with the Detroit Tigers and he hit his epic home run for the LA Dodgers to win the World Series on one leg. He, had a, he, he didn't play. He limped to the plate. He came up and he hit a home run left-handed. He was an all-star, probably being a Hall of Fame. But he was he was he led the Big Ten in receiving. He went to Michigan State. No kidding. So I mean, oh man, it was a lot. Of, I mean, it was the Big Ten. It was it was great. That's heyday history, man. That's uh, Tony Tony Dungy was at Minnesota. No kidding. Yeah. Was he playing football at the time? Was he? He's a DB. Yeah, he was a quarterback. Man, all quarterback? Big Ten quarterback. Yeah. Didn't you start out as a quarterback? I did start out as quarterback. Not so. <laughs> and then I got a coach. He said, no, that's not for you. <laughs> you were too fast <laughs> and too tall. <laughs> yeah, no question. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I'm going to have Kip Young. Kip Young, Kip Young played pitch for Detroit. He's a friend of mine. Uh, I'd like to see when he played up. I don't know what years he played, but okay. we had lunch once in a while. And uh, that'd be neat if he knew all those guys you're talking about. I'm sure he does. Yeah, if he's going to Detroit, he's going to know Kurt Gibson and those guys, Curtis Greer, you yeah. know, all those guys, man. We, you know, we, we, and we, and we, it was different. We developed relationships and things like that. I mean, we, we had a, it was a great time. It was a great, I thought it was a great time uh, to, for me to be yeah. where I was as an athlete and as a student athlete. Okay. Challenging back then. So you still, I mean, you were fresh out of the, the racial issues coming in that we were still, the United States was still recovering from or trying to come out of. And, and, and you had them in, in Wisconsin. A lot of my friends used to talk about that kind of stuff. I, I just, did, you know, I was so focused, man. You know, I mean, we playing two sports. It's hard enough playing one sport. Oh, for but, sure. you know, you're trying to play two sports and just be focused and locked in. I mean, I just didn't, you know, and people can say whatever they want. I, I really don't care. I mean, but, you know, I was trying to make it, you know. I literally was trying to make it. You know, I came from, you know, a, a, an environment. Both my parents were alcoholics. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't have much. And, you know, I just wanted to, um, just wanted a better life. Absolutely. And, and sports is, thank you know, I'm not a big like um, like sports is the answer guy, but for a lot of guys in the inner city, that is their ticket out. Yeah, it really is. Thank I God mean, for it, it. It can, yeah, it can be. And, and you know what I think? You know, I was talking to some guys this weekend, so I'm I'm big like this. There's so many life lessons you can learn from sports. You know, you know, it's a great place for your kids to meet friends, right? You meet friends, a great place to develop character and all of that kind of stuff. Um, of course, decision-making. I mean, I can go down the line. You know, 
um, sports is just a great, it's just a great bridge. It's a great community. And, you know, sports fans are some of the uh, most loyal fans that you're ever going to find because when yeah. people get a team and they get a player, they really stand behind them. And so you learn that kind of stuff, loyalty, all of that. Yeah. I mean, sports is a great, like, caveat for life. It's a great uh, metaphor for life. It really, really is. is. I think sports in perspective, that's where I'm at. Like, our kids played soccer. Josh played football. Um, some of the parents are like, my kid's going to the pro. They're, they're 10 years old, you know, yeah. my kid's going to the pro. So within it, I'm with you. The social aspect, the challenge, the, the, the it teaches you dedication and commitment, oh. uh, all yeah. that. I'm all for that. But after that. You got to compete. I, yeah. I, I don't like parents like that. So like, like you know, I, I do after school programs and I do a lot of camps. Yeah. That's what I do. I do sports ministry. So for me, I don't care about the sport. I don't care about who wins the game, man. You know, because that's not the real game. It's a scoreboard that's called a game called life. Yep. You know, and that's what that's what I want to see who wins that. Right. So what I want from kids is to learn these life lessons while they're playing ball, because you can learn these life lessons while you're having fun, right? And so it's not like it's life or death, but it can be important. And so sure. you know how to value things, right? And then you know how to say, you know what, man, I gave it my best, didn't work. You know, let me figure out what I could do to get better, leave it alone and move on, you know, versus, yeah. you know, some of the things, decision making, conflict resolution, because that's what's lacking in the world today. I see it a lot in the inner city. A guy, if you step on a guy's shoe or you punch him in the mouth, you'll get the same reaction with people because they don't understand conflict resolution, you know. And so you learn that in sport. You learn how to value things. You learn how to value each other. You learn how to value life. And, uh, and you can do it in a way that is fun. You know, should you have made that decision, what happened, man? You fumbled the ball, you cost us a game. So what can we do different versus should you have made that decision, you just killed somebody. You mm. know, that's a little bit different. You know, you can teach people how to make those decisions that, that would happen on the athletic field but transfer it to life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, the, under, I think the key there is, like you said, the team, the community, we rely on one another, we value another. We're going to put Ray Snell up front because that's where we're going, and he's going to lead the way, and we're going to follow yeah. him. I mean, that's and you, you know, you know what else I learned in sports? Here's what we here's what sports is really a teaching. See, in sports, we don't focus on what a person can't do. We want to know what you can do, Amen. right? And so, you know, so we really because success breeds confidence, right? So, what we're really going to do is we want to say, you know what, man, I want Patrick Mahomes throwing the ball. I don't want him blocking. Right. I want him throwing the bubble because if I put Patrick Mahomes on the line, he's not going to be as valued as he is if I put him back in. So if the coach came to you and said, hey, 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 hey Rob, um, you know that Patrick Mahomes, he can't block, man. He's no good. Well, if you evaluate him that way, he probably isn't. But if you put a football in his hand and let him drop back and throw, we're going to find out how good he is, how good he makes everybody else. Everybody, you know, put people in the, get the right people in the team and put them in the right position. We win championships. Amen. I like it. You know, that's that's a that's biblical too, right? I mean, I'm sure you know that. But like when we did a message on the feeding of the five thousand, Jesus mm -hmm. didn't say, uh, "Go and do all this stuff. Go feed these people. Go make it happen. Go count." The he didn't say that. He said, "Bring me what you have. What do you have? I have five loaves and two fish. Okay, yep. bring me that. Bring yep. it to God. I'll handle the rest." That's right. I'm with you, brother. I, I, I that's a good point. Because you could have easily said the opposite, you know, like look at what we didn't have instead of looking at what we do have. We got two fish and five loaves of bread, and that's because many as much in the hands of the master, right? That's all he said. Bring me what you have. <laughs> that's it, man. Give it to me. Well, if we could get that message out, wouldn't that be something? <laughs> it changed the world. It would change the world. Concentrate on yeah. people's what they have. Yeah. And work with them, not trying. Like I know church and ministry has been tough for me because. It's like they wanted me to do everything that I didn't want to do or didn't do well. Yeah. But what I do is put together events, put together people, find yeah. other people's strengths, and yeah. get them in action. Yeah, that's get it. Them off the bench, not on the side. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the name of the game. That's what I do. I mean, that's what Jesus did. Send the disciples out in pairs and let them do the work. Right. Amen. Yeah, go out, practice, bring them in, talk about, yeah. send them back out. They're just coaching. Yeah. That's all he did was coach, really. That's it. That's it, man. <laughs> By example. <laughs> <laughs> so I got um, – I was thinking, you and I met thir over 13 years ago. 
Yep. And I was going down the list of things we had done together. I cannot believe how much we, not only what you're doing alone with your other ministries, and we'll talk about them. Sure. Too. <clears throat> we met in 2013, 2012. We were planting a church down here. We were launching a brand new campus for First Church right here in Berlin. Yeah. Yep. They had nothing there for the first time in 50 years. Um, you know, this, uh, and I think like God was orchestrating this the whole time because I met, you know, Bill Allickson back in 1995 Wow! for an event that God orchestrated in 2012 and <laughs> 2011, 2012, when you came in the picture, yeah. and, I'm going to tell you, we planted that campus. You came and did the basketball game. It was you sports power, Bill Allickson. Yeah. And we brought in Kentucky greats. We had Dickie, yeah. B, Roger Harden, Troy McKinley, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jack Gibbons. Yeah. You guys played that exhibition basketball game. Yeah. We launched that campus. It's still running today. They bought a, about a one and a half million dollar building after wow. we did that and started it. And yeah. there's got to be 700 to 1,000 people going to that church right now. Wow. So thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. You, you, you obey God, right? <laughs> but God, yeah. started, God orchestrated that. I, I wrote this down on my thing years ago. This was mm -hmm. a work in the making. Amen. And we did Amen. that. And then you came out when I got my next church and did the revival. Yeah. I remember. I still have pictures, man. Baptized that kid. Remember? How many kids did you baptize? Do you remember? I know I, know I baptized the one. I, yeah. I think I baptized two or three. But I the think one, I put the, I put the robe on and baptized the one. I think I was baptized. Then you went and found a robe that fit me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, I think in total in the two or three days you were preaching out there uh i i counted six or seven i couldn't get the number right right but you baptized quite a few kids but i'm going to tell you brother that was 2012 and this is 2024 and people out there are still talking about what you did out there that 12 years later well we're still talking about it man i remember i remember um that's why i was 310 because we ate so good <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you made a big den in City Barbecue down here. <laughs> Beyond a doubt. <laughs> see what else I got here. So you played Wisconsin 1976. You played mm -hmm. basketball and football. You were yeah. a tight end. Uh, and uh, you wore numbers uh, 35 and 87. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Is yeah. that right? That's exactly right. <laughs> so you you transferred a tight end for West Wisconsin? Yeah, I transferred. So I played outside linebacker my first year. Okay. And then I didn't. I didn't like that. I wasn't like that. wasn't fit my didn't feel my my fit my skill set because I was a big guy fast and I like the ball in my hand. I played quarterback. Yeah. So that tight end, get the ball, run my routes, do what I needed to do. And uh, a guy that I admired, he played with the Oakland Raiders. His name was uh, Dave Casper, oh, and he yeah. wore number eighty-seven. Sure. So I wanted number eighty-seven. You know, I still have one of his football cards. Is that right? Yes, but I do. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're a big target, man. I mean, uh, why wouldn't they put you at, at something? And you ran okay, four, 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 five. Where'd you run? I ran four, four. Like <laughs> as big as I was, I can't believe I could move that fast, man. I can't either. That's that's fast. And, you, and you're talking about in the '70s when nobody else was doing it. Like now they run four, four, but in the '70s, if you ran four, six, four, seven, you were considered fast. Right. And I ran 4-4, four, four, man. It was unbelievable. Well, you had to be a standout back then because <laughs> to get drafted, to get noticed, I mean, there was no combine. There was – No, it wasn't. How, how did you get noticed? How would you say you got noticed by the pros? Well, you know, um, so, you know, of course, you know, we, I was playing in the Big Ten. So, I'm playing – at this time, the SEC isn't what it is now. Okay. The Big Ten was the number one football conference in the country at that time, Right. So we play in Michigan, Ohio State, all of those schools. You know, they had a lot of talent. A lot of people went from those schools that played in the NFL. So I, I just, I mean, I played well. You know, I, I did. And I finished second in the Big Ten and receiving two years. You know, uh, I was just doing my thing. And, and and so, you know, I got noticed. And so back then, because they didn't have a combine, so they would take the top 50, top 100 players, and every week they would fly us around to a different team. You okay. know, and we'd work out for that team. And, and that was really challenging because you had to stay ready. So you come out the football season, you play in the college all-star games, and then you, you know, you get the, um, you know, the trial for the team. Now, while we're young, so it's not like it's that taxing on us, but having a combine where you can just say, you know what, I just got to be ready for this one day. Yeah. And, and that's good and bad because 
you know, that's what sports is about. Sports are about, can you do it today? Right. You know, can you, can you do it today? And then the thing I love about the combine is you bring all the top players and we get to compete, man, against each other. Yeah. And that's what you want as an athlete, you know, you know how this military, you want to, I want to compete. <laughs> I want to compete, man. That's you know, right. you're doing the bodybuilding, but you want to compete, right? <laughs> I don't do that. You know? <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. I just, I just want to compete, man. Let's, let's line it up. You know, let's see who's the best. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, um, it's not really who's the best. It's really who wants it more. That's right. You know, that's how it is in life, man. Because there are people more talented than all of us. But that don't mean they win. That's right. You know, um, a friend of mine, he told me this yesterday. While I was in Texas, he said, uh, what's too common? In, Calvin Coolidge said this. What's common in America is when talented men um, aren't successful. You know, because, you know, talent, you know, it, it you know, talent don't mean you win. Talent don't mean you're successful. It, it, it's not based on that. It's really based on, number one, our relationship with God. We know that now, you know, because God don't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. But also, it, it you know, takes discipline. It takes hard work. It takes consistency. You know, all of that kind of stuff. Desire, determination. That's how you win. That's right. And, and making good decisions. Yeah. Yeah, how many talented guys never made it? I, I would say, and I've told my son, and I could be wrong, but I would say that talent's a great thing to have. You have a great advantage on a lot of people. But sure. work ethic will all, I believe, work ethic, if if you have a little bit of talent, work ethic's going to gonna get you the win every time. The desire well, like you, to be number one, to be the best. I mean, if you're four foot five, you think you're going to go to the NFL and be, you know, be a Hall of Famer, I would say no. But to have the basics... And a work ethic, I think you would be uh, a lot better off. Well, you don't, right? Because I mean, there's so many talented people. We sit. I saw. I can't tell how many talented people I saw this weekend in the prison. I'm yeah. sitting there now. I'm in the prison. You know, this. I don't think I talked to one person this weekend in the prison that hadn't that had not been locked up more than 25 years. Not one person. I've, I've met. I met a guy this weekend in the prison. He was 68 years old. He's been locked up for 51 years. Wow. He was 68. And I'm sitting in a prison and you got all these inmates and they, they men had all this homosexuality going on and they got all this stuff. And I couldn't have been in a better place. Yeah. I was so at peace and so connected with God. I mean, I could feel God's presence. And I, and I knew I was in the right place and I knew I was working and walking in my purpose. And I couldn't wait to get up and share because I knew that God had given me a message for such a time as this. I'm sitting there and I'm just thanking God I'm just like this. I'm like God, man, so awesome, man. Thank you. And, and and because I knew, first of all, I got saved in prison. I got saved in prison, right? So, you know, I'm back home. I'm the prodigal son returning, you know? And and so, you know, now I'm here. And and the good thing was, you know, even though, like, like when people saw us that morning, well, what you up to today? Well, I'm getting ready to go to prison. What? <laughs> what did you do? Well, not what I did, it's what I'm getting ready to do, you know? And, and I'm sitting there. And I'm just thanking God for giving me an opportunity. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, I was able to connect with some of the inmates in such a way, man, because again, man, my one of my main goals is just to be authentic. Yeah. You know, I just want to be authentic, man. Hey, you know, I love telling that story, man, how what I thought was the worst thing that could ever happen to me in the worst place is where I found God and where my life changed. My life changed because I went to prison. Yeah. And, you know, that's where I got set free. Yeah. That's where I found God, and that's where God made sense. And so I was sharing with them about how this is a defining moment. And the thing about defining moments is they wrapped up like ordinary days. It looked like any other day, but it can be a defining moment if you let it. Yeah. You know, and that's what happened to me on April the 17th, 1998. It was a defining moment. Today I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I didn't get up thinking that. Yeah. You know, that wasn't even part of my plan. I didn't even know God. Yeah, but it was a defining moment because I had my cup right side up. I could receive, and mm -hmm. because I could receive, and I was ready to receive, man, God poured into my cup, changed my life. But here's the thing of it that's even better than that: not only did He change my life, but He changed anybody I meet. He, their life has changed because of the decision I made on April the seventeenth, nineteen ninety-eight. Absolutely. Look at my kids. Look at my wife. Look yeah. at us. We would have never met. No, no, that's right. That's right. We wouldn't have. April 17, 19, 1998. All Changed right. Changed my life. So I remember you've always said, I mean, we've had extensive conversations. Uh, you didn't know who you were for a long time. 
You knew no, all these things were happening. They were happening quickly. I mean, you're six foot one, 150, 160 pounds in seventh and eighth grade. That's a yep. big dude. And then, uh, you know, you go into the, the NCAA, you play ball. And then in 1980, you're drafted in the third round by Pittsburgh. Yep. By Pittsburgh. Tell me about that. So what they did back then is like every half an hour, they give you an update of who got drafted in this round, like, like every 10 players or something like that, or every five players. So the night before the draft, I got a call from two people. I got a call from the Buffalo Bills, and I got a call from the Cleveland Browns. Oh, wow. And both, both of them told me they were going to take me in the first round the next day. The Bills said, hey, man, uh, we drafted this guy named Tom Cousineau from Ohio State the year before. He was the number one pick in the draft. Wow. And they said, man, we need a tight end, uh, Ray. And uh, our fans went crazy because Cousineau, he didn't have a great college career apparently, but he's a big, strong guy. He had all the measurables. And they said now, and then they said, this year we're going to take a basketball player with the first pick. So I'm excited. You know, yeah. like, man, I'm going in the first round. Cleveland Browns call me, hey, man, if we draft you, would you want to be a Cleveland Browns? I'm saying, man, I want to go anywhere <laughs> That, that, that would have me. So the first round went by. The Bills draft pick come up. They don't draft me. Matter of fact, they take another tight end, a guy named Junior Miller, right? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. And then other people got drafted. Then the second round came. I'm still not drafted. I'm like, man, I can't take this. And then we had a TV crew in my house. I'm up in Wisconsin. We had a TV crew in my house. And every time the phone rang, you know, um, they turn the camera on. Wait a minute, Ray, wait. And they turn the camera on. Is this a call? I'm um, hello. And it'd be one of my friends. Hey, man, you get drafted yet? <laughs> I'm like, oh. hey, don't call me, please. <laughs> you know, and so um, I finally got frustrated. Yeah. Because I'm like, man, I can't take this. And, and, and I leave the house. Again, there's no cell phones. I need to go for a walk, man. I need to clear my head because in my mind, I'm sinking in the draft. Yeah. And then um, when I, when I came back home, Right, I got rid of I got rid of everybody. I just need to be alone. So when I came back home, I had already been drafted, but I didn't know it. Right, so so I'm like, I turn the draft back on. I'm watching all these now they're in the fourth round, and I didn't know I'd already been drafted. Wow, so it was a little <laughs> tough, man. And then yeah. finally they called back, and I talked to Chuck Noll, and and I got and I realized I was a Pittsburgh Steelers, and they were the world champions. They had just beat the Dallas Cowboys in the Super Bowl, and so wow. um. You know, man, I got drafted, and then the next day you fly fly to that city for your press conference. I meet all these guys, you know, Mean Joe Green, Terry Bradshaw, Lynn Swan. I meet all these guys, you know. Yeah. My guys who I had admired, I had watched play, they had the steel curtain. Yeah. And it, you know, it was different. Well, growing up there, you know, uh, in Youngstown, yeah. uh, I mean, I uh, that was my team, the Steelers. So okay. you're walking with all my heroes, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I I thought you were going to tell me. I didn't know uh, Ozzie Newsom played for the Browns back in that time frame too, didn't mm -hmm. he? Ozzie was there then. He was oh, in tight end. Okay. So how long? Did, so you go to the Steelers. You talk to Chuck Knoll. You hang out. You make the team. They draft you third round. Uh, was it yep. 83rd, 89th pick? Something like that? Yeah, I think it was the 80, 83rd pick. 83rd pick. Okay. Then you uh, – how do you end up with Philadelphia? Well, number one, I was immature. Okay. Super immature. Right. Um, you know, I, I'm, I was so used to um, being every team I was on, well, not every team, but most of the teams I was on, it was always centered around me. Right. And, you know, um, so I go to Pittsburgh, man. Number one, they had no they had no use for rookies. They just won their fourth Super Bowl. They, they had a tight end named Benny Cunningham. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so um, they could care less. Now, I'm in practice. And every day, man, I would go against Donnie Shell, right? Oh, yeah. Every day, man. And, you know, man, I I, I would destroy him, man, in practice. You and, did? Oh, my gosh. Is he, he in the Hall of Fame? He is in the Hall of Fame. I so. But so what Donnie Shell was good at, yeah. he was great at run support. Okay. Most safeties can't cover. Right. And, man, I used to light him up, man. But I was in my children, I light him up. And, you know, this guy's a Hall of Famer, and I'm out there dancing and talking trash. They was like, man, we got to get rid of this guy. Man, he don't understand the respect. Because yeah. I didn't. I didn't understand the respect that that guy deserved. Yeah. You know, I didn't. So I'm out there. I'm catching the ball. 
shaking and I'm, yeah, yeah, you can't cover me. No, no. He said, okay, don't worry. We don't have to worry about covering you. We're going to get you out here right away. So they cut me. Oh, still has cut me, man. I didn't and, know. Uh, oh, I, I didn't know it was coming either. Wow, <laughs> that's something I didn't know about you. You didn't tell yeah. me that. Oh, my gosh. Let me okay. tell you something. And that was a rude awakening. I bet. That was a rude awakening, man, because I knew I played well enough mm -hmm. because I could play. Yeah. But uh, I didn't fit into their system. Yeah. I didn't understand, like, you know, protocol. And then, you know, um, they would have this thing where you had a uh, senior school fight on. Yeah. And so we're, we're in, at dinner, and, and me and Joe Green would hit his glass, ding, ding, ding. And when he does that, he's going to call somebody to sing that school fight song. Sure. So he did it and he said, hey, Big Rook. That's what they called me. Big Rook, get up there and sing your school fight song. And I looked at him. I said, no, I'm Ooh. not doing it. Yeah. Y'all can't make me. That was so, man, I was such an idiot, man. Uh, I had to have a Coke and, in his mouth. <laughs> yeah, man. I, you know, I was full of myself, man. Yeah. You know, the Bible says pride comes before the fall. Yeah. And so, um, man, they, they, you know, they said, we got to get this guy out of here. So you leave yep. there, you go to Philly, they pick you up right away. You play with so Philly uh, picked me up. Yeah, and, um, I had never played wide receiver before. Okay. I was a quarterback, outside linebacker, now I'm a tight end. Well, Philly had a wide receiver named Harold Carmichael. Yeah. You know, six eight, like me, long, and they wanted me to be the next Harold Carmichael. And I, I was faster than Harold and taller than Harold. And um, you know, I thought I was better than her. I still hadn't learned my lesson yet. You know, because, you know, now I'm playing wide receiver, which is a finesse position, which didn't really um, compute in my mind because I like a little bit of contact and stuff. But I go to Philly and I'm playing wide receiver. And I liked it because they throw you the ball. But that's when I when I get to Philly, man, I start having a lot of injuries, stuff okay. like that. And and a lot of it is because my drug my drug use start taking off, Okay, you know, in Philly. So now my body, which I could always count on now, is starting to break down. Well, drug use, and I know, again, we've talked about this uh, back in the 60s and 70s. It was kind of like under the radar, kind of common. It happened. Yeah. And specifically, you know, with athletes, a lot of them had the money to buy it. And, of course, anybody that's around an athlete, and, you know, I've been around thousands of athletes, and literally, uh, they all, everybody wants a piece of you. Mm -hmm. And if that's their way in, it could be drugs. So, when you, would you say that that was that your the beginning of your downfall in Philly the injuries the drug use or what was what well you... well the drug use definitely because it, it, I believe when I look back the drug use led to the injuries right yeah but you know the thing about life and you know you hear the same when, when you talk about addiction they say one is too many and a thousand is never enough right sure and you hear this thing about addictive personalities well in my life. I was always able to master anything I wanted to. Sure. You know, I was a good student, you know, whatever you name, whatever I did, I could master it. Yep. But cocaine was my um, kryptonite. Okay. And I, I didn't know it. You know, you don't know that you have an addictive personality until sometimes until you become addicted, right? Right. And so, um, you know, a lot of people experimented with, with, with cocaine and drugs and stuff like that. But like, I could walk away from anything. Yeah. You know, I tried smoking cigarettes. I did all that stuff. I could smoke a pack of cigarettes or whatever. And if I didn't want another one, I just leave it alone and never even think about it. But, but cocaine was different for me. Sure. Cocaine was my Achilles heel. Sure. You know, first of all, I loved doing it. The way it made me feel. It, it hit my pleasure system in a way that nothing else had. Right. And then the other thing was it really connected with my addictive thinking and my addictive brain where I had no boundaries. Yeah. It came to that. Yeah. And so, um, you know, as much as I love sports, obviously a guy played two sports and all of that stuff, did it all my life. I love sports. Um, in my mind, I thought I loved cocaine more. Cocaine yeah. became more important to me than playing ball. Got you. Well, that'll that'll do it. And and you just don't know to and I and believe me, I, I've heard a lot of people say the same thing about that specific drug. Like marijuana is a gateway drug. It makes you yeah. feel, give you the munchies, put you to sleep, whatever. Yeah. But you get that. The the friends that I know that have cocaine have said it is it'll grab a hold of you, and you don't yeah. know. Yeah, go ahead. I had I had other friends that did it and could walk away from it like I could walk away from everything else, but I couldn't. Yeah, it, I, I got I got hooked. Yeah, and and when you get hooked, and then you know you're willing to go to any length to get more. That's right. I didn't have an off button. 
And, and it was a shame, man, because uh, it turned me into the person that I didn't like. Yeah. And it destroyed my reputation. It obviously destroyed my career, but it destroyed my reputation with people because people felt like, you know, they didn't want to be around me. They couldn't trust me. And, and, and they could see what I couldn't see. See, I called it fun and they called it insanity. Yeah. And it's funny because, you see, people that's caught up in an addiction, no matter what kind of addiction it is, it is, they call chaos excitement. Yeah. And see, I call chaos excitement. Sure. You know, all this craziness. Oh, man, isn't that exciting? And I was destroying my life. And, you know, sure. uh, you know, I often say the thing that I the thing that I needed the most or thought I needed the most was the thing that was destroying my life. Sure. And I was in love with something that didn't love me back. And the devil was sifting me as wheat. You know, he came to rob, kill and destroy. And, you know, in the beginning, the devil was stealing stuff from me. But. At some point, I started giving it to him. Yeah. Gladly. Yeah. Here, please take this. Please take that. Have your way. Yeah. And all the uh, consequences that, that happened in my life, right? So these consequences, I looked at it like it was it was always something else other than the drugs. The reason that this happened, it wasn't the drugs, you know, the cocaine. And see, one thing about addiction and drugs and stuff like that. It's always going to sin. It's always going to protect itself, mm -hmm. right? And it was protecting itself in my life. So, you know, I shouldn't have been on that street at that time. No, you shouldn't have been doing drugs. Yeah. You know, I shouldn't have been drunk, you know, but it was never the drugs. It was always another circumstance, another situation. Right. And, you know, I had to be broken. Yeah. And it took me a long time because I had a high tolerance of pain. Sure. And I, and, 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 and I still glorified that lifestyle. Well, the devil paints a pretty picture. He does. So what year would you say was the end of your NFL uh, career? Uh, I think it was around 85, 86. I'm grateful, you know, because I am a new creature. You know, I'm a new creature today, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And so, you know, you said this earlier with the devil meant for evil. God had used it for good. You know, the very thing that I got kicked out of the NFL for is the very thing they bring me back for. You know, I got kicked out of the NFL because I lived an illicit lifestyle. I was doing drugs, you know womanizing, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so now when teams want somebody to come and talk to players or if they have a situation, it's not unusual for me to get a phone call, you know, to share with somebody because it's scriptural. You know, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, right? Yeah. And so, you know, um, because I went through that and I learned my lesson, you know, one of the things I was sharing with the guys in the prison this past weekend is that a smart man learns from his own mistakes. A wise man learns from other people's mistakes and a fool doesn't learn anything, mm. right? And so I had, you know, that was me. But now that I've learned from my mistakes, now that I can teach somebody and more than, you know, talking about God, man, I got to live this thing. And so, you know, I'm living it now, you know, and not bragging. I, I, I don't I want to come off as a braggart or anything like that because it cost me something to be here. Mm -hmm. It cost me a lot. Just like it's costing somebody, and it costs you a lot to be here. You know, your, your story may not be, you know, drugs and alcohol, but we all had a sin problem because we got a sin nature. Absolutely. Right. And so, you know, um, because mine is something that was really like um, tangible, something that was really like crack is high profile, you know. And so people hear that. Some people say, oh, it was a crackhead and all. And I was. But now I'm a man of God. Yep. And so you can see, man, I've been homeless. I've been all of those things. I've been in prison. I've been all of those things. That was after the NFL. And like I, when I said with the people in prison this weekend, I said, how you like me now? Because, right? <laughs> you know, that ain't my story. That ain't my testimony. I'm free, man. Amen. I am absolutely free it's by the part, grace of God. Part of who you are, but not who you are. And, and I, and I, it's I, just my say, story. My past is a part of who I am. Yeah. For I, I am who I am because of my past. Not that I, again, glory in my past. Yeah. And I and Heidi knows and my mind was always women. I love the girls. So yeah. it cost me a lot, you know, chasing yeah. the girls. So um, I mean, you know, I, I was a walk on at Florida in ninety four and it was a, a girl that changed my mind to playing. Um yeah. wow. She wanted me to cheat on my wife and I wouldn't do it. And that's yeah. when I, like that's when God got a hold of me and said, You have a decision to make. You I was in the gator room, I just made a team as a walk on, I wasn't recruited, yeah. made the yeah. tryout, signed the papers. And then got faced talking to her. And I said, well, let me think about this. If I'm going to go out hanging with you, I got to go tell my wife. I told her I'd never cheat on her. 
Right. Yeah. Go home and tell Heidi, you know, just, <laughs> I'm going to go play football. This is, you know, this ain't going to work. She goes, she grabs my hand, brother. And she says, there's nothing you can do to make me leave you. Wow. And I felt that big. Wow. Yeah. Never went back. I said, well, football is not for me then. Cause yeah. it's lead down the wrong path. I love her more than that. We stayed yeah. up driveway till five o'clock in the morning, watch the sun come up. And all that went behind me at that point. That guy, that's when God Amen. changed my life was when Heidi said, there's nothing you can do. It's the first time in my life where I felt true love. Yeah. It all yeah. Come. She had my back. Yeah. So it, it was, it was life changing. So I never went back. And then I got the call from, I think it was J Jamie Speronis or somebody called me and says, Hey, you, you're not even applied at the university of Florida yet. And I'm like, I'm not coming. I'm going to go, go to Maryland, go to Bible college. And that was, yeah. it. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. And she changed my life. So we have those moments and we're no longer those men. Defining moments, right? That's what I'm talking about earlier. Defining right. moments. That's right. A part of who I am, not proud of it, yeah. but it makes me wiser to go forward as the man God made me today as he's making you. So yeah. you play, you play NFL, you play college uh, in, in the mid eighties, that all goes away. And then you have this transformation. You get saved in 1998 yeah, so I still got a ways to go. See, I'm still, you know. Don't we all? Yeah, I mean, but, you know, I mean, I'm still like in 85, man, 86 when I leave. And, and then I went to the USFL. Oh, did you, you play know? USFL? Yeah, I went to the Michigan Panthers in the USFL. Didn't know that one. That's new yeah. information. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it was short-lived because yeah. I, went, I went to the USFL and I, I tore my knee up. Okay. You remember, I saw, I saw every year, I, every year, man, I had an injury. I mean, man, like my um, second year with the Eagles, I played like I wanted to play. Yeah. I, now I understand what it is to be a wide receiver, right? I've been in the system for a year, and man, I'm I'm, I'm unstoppable now. I'm unstoppable. I mean, I'm I'm like unstoppable. I'm, I'm playing. You know, Dick Vermeil said, you know, in the newspaper that I'm the most improved player on the team. Outstanding. You know, um, all of this stuff, man. I'm doing my thing. You know, yeah. so so after practice, what we should do um, is we call it cooling down. But you know, practice in the NFL, you got four thousand fans out there watching practice. Sure. You know, and so man, but I used to love because we take our pads off, right? And I'm in shape. I'm cut up. You got you ain't got no shirt on your head. You know, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. And we had a little shorty shorts on because we wore shorty shorts back then, right? <laughs> Yeah, we call ranger panties in the army, ranger panties. Yeah. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and, and so I'd run, and man, i tell the quarterback, just throw it out there let me go get it. he throw it out there. I, go, shh, shh. I shook them gear, I'm gone. And I just catching the whole crowd. They go, ah, they scream. <laughs> I love that applause, right? And uh, one and quarterback threw it out there, Ron Jaworski, and I went to go get it. And I, I tore my quad muscle. Oh, you're kidding you know? me. Yeah, I tore my quad, man, and, and I fell over it. Big old knot in my thigh, and then I'm out for six weeks. Ugh. I'm on crutches for like a month, so I couldn't walk. And that's that's what happened to me. That's the kind of things that happened to me. Then the next year, you know, I took, messed my shoulder up. The first year was my back, you know, and I just kept getting hurt, kept getting hurt. And so, so then same thing in the USFL, because I was one of those guys, you know, I just like to talk trash. I, mean, I like to compete. I want your best, you know, and, and so, um, I remember, man, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm killing these guys and I'm talking trash. And then I, I caught the pass and I hit me in my, my, my knee. I felt it, but I had never had a knee injury before. And I went and I took a knee and my knee wouldn't straighten up. So I had knee surgery. So, uh, you know, my season was over. And yeah. that, that was that was the story. But again, man, a lot of that, see, I was in shape. I was all of those things. But I, now I'm, I'm really getting high and stuff like that. You know, I'm, I'm really – not living the kind of life that somebody that depends on their body should be living. Right. But again, I didn't see it that way because I could still perform, but it would be critical moments. And I would, you know, I would get hurt and stuff like that. And, um, and it caught up with me. Now I, I'm out of the NFL. I've got all this money and all this time and I got a habit. I got a cocaine habit. Yeah. So I came home and did what addicts do. I got high. You know, that's what I did, man. I got high. I, I don't think people realize, and I you know this is just my own personal experience at Florida, was literally, it was a job. Yeah. Playing sports, and that's just one sport. You play two. If you were going to go, and I just had a brief interaction with these people, they were giving you tutors. 
a lot of guys got degrees like phys ed just to play ball. It, yeah. it wasn't a serious degree, but they had talent. And so when these guys were talking about getting paid, I was always in favor of college athletes getting paid. Sure. Because sure. it's a job to be an athlete. It is. I don't know how you did two two sports, bro. Well, and not only is it a job, the other side of it is you generate revenue. Yeah. See, so so you know, it's not like they're giving you anything. Right. You know, nobody comes to the game to, to see the coach. You know, nobody comes to the game to see the huddle. Nobody comes to the game to see the cheerleaders. You know, they come to see the players, and especially if you're you playing these major programs, you're a star player. Can't tell you how many people in the stands with my jerseys on. Oh, for sure. You know, I mean, you know, and, and you, you know, all of this stuff, man. And so, you know, you it ain't like you're not generating revenue. And then I was also expected to be in class. And see, you know, so now here's the thing. And I'm not asking anybody to feel sorry for us and any of that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, it's Friday. Or this is this is it's Michigan week. <laughs> and they're number two in the country. Yeah. And you know the games are on a big ten game in the week, but you got a couple of exams this week. But you're, you're 19, 20 years old. Uh, it's going to be national TV, 90,000 people in the game. And, you know, it might be five because, you know, big school may have 5,000 people in our lecture hall, but it ain't the same. No. So what's the chances of me studying my books or studying my playbook? I got to make that decision. Not to mention, if I catch a couple touchdowns this week, I might get a couple more girls. <laughs> you know? I mean, hey, you know, that's that, true. Hey, I mean, all that stuff factors in. And, and so people don't right. understand. Sometimes, and I, again, man, they, oh, you're getting an education, man, you can't. And then nobody, I'm telling you right now, I know it was constant. I know some other schools, we had to be at practice every day at 2.30. So if I had any classes after 2.30, I couldn't take them. Right. You can say what you want. You can't take them. Nobody cares about that because if you don't, if you don't um, be at practice, you lose your scholarship, right? That's right. So, I mean, I'm glad they're doing it differently. Because then I, I've seen guys, man, who were better than me, Got injured in college, had nothing to fall back on because, mm -hmm. yeah. I remember them telling me when I, I had to have five years eligibility. Yeah. Uh, scholarship players play first. Gator yeah. boosters, uh, kids play second. And walk-ons probably play their fourth or fifth year. Yeah. If and that, right? If that. And meantime, yeah. you're working a job, you're you're going to school. That's a lot. So yeah. I, I'm with you. And I, and I, I, I always thought – the kids should get four or five hundred dollars a week minimum, mm -hmm. even across the board. Because, like you said, I mean, what's what's Ohio State worth a billion dollars? Yeah, you know, well, Wisconsin, Alabama. I mean, the big schools. I mean, who has a man, look? Wisconsin, man, I can't even imagine, I can't even begin to tell you the alumni association, the businesses. I mean, we would have said, we and again in Madison, Wisconsin, we are the protein. Mm -hmm. There's no oh, yeah. other protein there. Yeah. We are the pro team. We got 55,000 students, right? That's right? And so, you know, and then not to mention you have a big game, man. You have some injuries and stuff, and you got a 9 o'clock class tomorrow. Well, what's the chances of me being there? That's right. Yeah. You know, because I got to get ready because we got Ohio State next week. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you know? you're watching films and reading playbooks. You ain't studying. That's true. Yeah, we, we can't. Yeah, it's you know? rough. I'm glad, that, uh, I'm glad that they're doing the NIL right now. Uh, I think that's good. Uh, unfortunately, not every kid's that popular to make that money. But at least they get the opportunity. Well, that's why what you said earlier. I think it should be across the board, right? I, I would like to. See I, I think like I think it should be like this: freshmen get a certain amount, sophomores, yeah. juniors, seniors. Yeah. Just do it like that, man. I mean, that's that's about the fast way that you can do it. I mean, I get it. I mean, you know, um, athletics is about performance. You play better, you get more. I mean, that's, that's right. how it goes. I mean, so you can put bonuses in there, but at least have a base. Yes. And then say, you know, here's a bonus. The schools don't want to do that. They don't want to be involved in that, right? They want the player, but they want somebody else to do that. So now what they're doing at college and stuff, they're hiring general managers. And a friend of mine, he's he's the NIL guy at Purdue, you know? And um, because they, I mean, he told me two years ago, the football coach came to him and said, hey, man, for us to get the guys we want, I need $12 million for NIL money this year. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's money. That's big money. That is big money. Wow. So let me ask you another thing. So no money back then. You're working hard. Tell me about Sugar Ray's theme. About my what? Sugar Ray's theme, the song in Wisconsin. Oh, yeah, Sugar Ray. So that happened. We were playing Michigan State, Magic Johnson in there. Okay. Right? So we playing Magic Johnson in there at Wisconsin. And um, so um, they had, Magic Johnson had a guy he should throw the alley-oops to. His name was Greg Kelso, right? That's the guy he threw the alley-oops to. Okay. So, um. Anyway, we playing him, man. Greg Kelsey at the top of the key. He shaked the guy. 
and the guy hooked him and fouled him, but he could fly. He kept coming to the, the rim. And, I, you know, man, I, I, I like to be, I was the enforcer on our team. I like to get physical. I want to bump and grind. So when he came to the he came to the basket, I grabbed his face and slammed him <laughs> right to the ground. That was legal back then. Yeah, yeah. That that's was legal, cool. right? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I, you know, that's how I played, right? I just yeah. want you to know, man, you know, that's how we're gonna do it. If you come in here, be ready. So they had a guy on their team, big guy like me, came running off the bench and he didn't realize I'm from the city. You know, I've been in a fight or two before. <laughs> and, and he came running and I just clocked him. Bam! I clocked him. He went back like that, and then all of a sudden the band went ba boom, ba boom, and everybody started saying "Sugar Ray," ba boom, and that's how I started. Man. I love it. You know, that's how I started. I wasn't the best player on the basketball team, but I was a fan favorite, right? But what people loved about me was they knew I was going to give them everything I had. Whatever yeah. I got, you're going to get it. Yep. You know, whatever it was, yep. whatever I got. I mean, I played. I played um, like four or six games um, with a with a fractured foot, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, they, you know, back then they tape it up real good, man. You get out there and play. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, you know how it is. The drilling gets it flowing. You know, and, and I mean, I, you know, that's just how it was. And again, this is just my story. I'm not trying to brag. I'm not trying to say anything like that. I'm just saying that's how hungry I was. Yeah. You know, I, I was hungry. Yeah. See, this is a, when you say that about bragging, I, I don't know. This is a Rob thing. I don't know why people get offended or feel they can't talk about things they have or things they've accomplished. If it's yeah. the truth, it's the truth. Yeah. I'm not going to be offended because you were better. I'm a competitor. You're a competitor. Yeah. I am not going to be offended and say, I'm going to take you to school. Anthony Bonner always said, I don't care how good of a shooter you are. You got to get that shot off. Yeah. I'm and yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I don't know why, if you did that, if you accomplished that, if you were that good, there is nothing wrong with sharing the truth about your situation. We shouldn't See, get it because somebody tells everybody you. I don't feel like, you know, you know, some, you know, you know, sometimes in places, I mean, it's my life, man. I enjoy it. I got some regrets. Trust me, man. I got a ton of regrets. Do. You know, you know, my biggest regret in life is the first time I ever did cocaine. You know, yeah. I wish it changed my life. Right. The defining moment. You know, when I talk about defining moments, man. That was a defining moment, man. I, I never, I, all I wanted to do that day was to have some fun with my friends, be accepted to be like to fit in. Absolutely. I had no idea I was making a life changing decision. And that's why I talk about defining moments because see, defining moments are wrapped up like regular days. You, you know, you have no idea. That's why you got to make the right decision. We can only make the right decision when we connect it with God. That's right. When we connect it with God and do things God's way, we don't have to, it's going to be a defining moment. But, you know, man, you know, it's going to come with a blessing, you know, but man, you have the other defining moment and you make a decision because based in, in ignorance doesn't matter. The devil don't care about you being ignorant. Uh -huh. And so as a matter of fact, he's going to take advantage of you. That's why you got to be in the Bible teaching church and the yeah. Bible teaching pastor had the right people in your life so you can make the right decisions. The right. devil, he looks for that, man. That's like that sheep that left, you know, the, the flock, when, when Jesus left the 99 to go up to the one because that dumb sheep left the flock he out there, man, the devil's going to have his way with him. Absolutely. Right? And so that's what he will do with us, too. That's what he did with Ray Sidnor. Man, that day when I did that cocaine for the first time, man, I had no idea I was making a life-changing decision. I was making a life-changing decision. Yeah. At the age of 20, how could I know? You couldn't. couldn't. How many of us do? And you know what? People don't understand the pressure athletes are under. They can say, oh, that guy messed up. He did it. They have no clue what you guys are going through. And, but just like kids today, though, that's what I'm saying. So yeah. let's say you never play ball right. in your life. Let's say you don't even like sports. You're going to play in a game called life. And if you're not equipped, you're going to fail. Right. It's just as simple as that. I ain't going to sugarcoat it. You're going to fail. So that's why when I go into schools, I can tell this story. I can talk about, man, I didn't know. But when I tell you one thing, when you leave here, you won't be able to say you didn't know because I'm going to tell you the truth. Right. Now, that's why I said a smart man learns from his own mistakes. A wise man learns from other people's mistakes. But a fool doesn't learn anything. You're going to know. I'm going to share the truth with you. Now, like it says in Deuteronomy, I'm going to set before you life and good, blessings and curses. Therefore, what? Choose life. And the beauty of choosing life is says so both you and your descendants may live. Amen. How about that? <laughs> Think that's about man, that's amazing. Yes. But that's godly wisdom. That's how we win. 
That's right. Anything else, man, you're going to fall short. And even with godly wisdom, don't mean you won't have challenges. That's right. But the thing of it is, it's going to help you. It's not going to hurt you. Because, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes God stretches us. The devil's going to condemn us. You're going to have challenges in life. But if you're doing it with the devil, man, but but man, he come to rob, kill, and destroy. Yeah. That's what he's going to do. He don't want to hurt you real bad. He wants to devour you. And we'll, then we'll blame God. That's why I love James. He said, let no man say, right? When he right. said, right? No, he was tempted, he was tempted by God because God don't tempt with evil. People Amen. will blame God for stuff he ain't got nothing to do with. People will blame the devil for stuff he ain't got nothing to do with. Flip right. Wilson used to say what? The devil made me do it. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. The devil ain't got nothing to do with that, man. Because uh, the Bible says you what? Tempted by your own lust. That's right. That's right. We make it. And when lust is full blown, it turns to sin. And when sin is full blown, what? Leads to death. Leads to death. That's right. Wow. Well, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says God doesn't put us in situations that we can't handle. And, and nothing that ain't common to man. And he always gives us a way of escape. The yeah. problem is how many of us put ourselves in those situations. Yeah. And then we, like you said, I'm going with what you said. And then we want to blame God for our, our where we're at. And he didn't even exactly. put us there. Yeah. yeah, but blame God him. God took my look. God took my son. Your son was out there selling drugs on the corner. He carried a gun. He was robbing people. God ain't take him. Right. You know, I mean, and, and, and because that's the kind of stuff we deal with, right? Right. We deal with that, you know. And so, as pastors, you know, man, we have to deal with that. We have to be of the mindset of still loving people and and and, and love them enough to correct them in a loving way that they can receive it and realize this ain't how God works. And see, because you know, you know. I had a guy on Facebook today, man, he trying to say, man, you know, because because like the Bible says, there ain't nowhere in the Bible what he's saying. <laughs> but in some people's mind, because he mentioned Bible, they think it's creditable. He don't know the Bible. And then they think that's how God works. That's yeah. why they need people like us. That's right. right? Be real. They need Just people be like real. Us. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it real and live it, man. Because it ain't about what you say. It's about what you do. I'll tell you, man, I that's you just hit on a point that we were taught. My daughter and I were talking about yesterday, and that was there was a girl on YouTube saying, I'm a Christian, so I'm allowed to say this. And she was just judging everybody. Yeah. I'm like, man, you just gave the Bible a bad name. You gave God a back. You, this is not what God's about. God's about love. And now he'll correct yeah. you. He'll discipline you. Yeah. Guide you. Those but he love, he chastises, right? That's right. Right. Out of love. She was just hammering people. And I'm like, please take the word Christian out of your video. <laughs> but people will believe her because she said one thing. She said, I'm a Christian. This, yeah. she, that probably, quite a while. She, may, she may or may not be a Christian. I don't know. But I know I, I know I know this. That's enough for people to have credibility in their mind is give her credibility. And right. She's talking about something that got nothing to do with the Bible and got nothing to do with God's work. Or none of that kind of stuff. But then we judge God because she said something ignorant. That's right. That's right. Man, I love that. That's that's real. That's real. It happens. And brother, I hate it. Put the name pastor. Put the name church. Put the yeah. It ain't, and none of it's right. Yeah. And we want to blast yeah. people when God just wants to love people. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't get that. Let's talk about some of the ministries you're involved in. So that's all in the past. This is a part of who you were. Yeah. Now let's yep. talk about who it Ray is today as a new creature in Christ Jesus. Okay, mm -hmm. you're out doing prison ministry. What is um I wrote down some ministry, Strong Tower Church. What was yep. Strong Tower Church? So Strong Tower Church was a church I preached at, right? So I, I preached there, man, Pastor Donnelly, right? And I, I can't remember how I met him, but he asked me to come there and share. And one of the things he did at his church, man, that I love. Because you know, again, you know, I do sports ministry. I, I thank God because two things I, I spent my whole life doing I love. It's sports and God. And God has allowed me to combine them into a ministry, right? So at Pastor Donnelly's church, he allowed um, me to come in and do for his three days of vacation Bible school, we did a sports camp. So mm -hmm. that was great, man, because we were able to advertise the sports camp. So kids, you know, we took a certain age group. I think we did six to 14-year-olds. And you come in and learn how to play football and basketball, but we're going to teach you some Bible lessons. And, man, it blew up. Yeah. Everybody was there. You know, yeah. parents came. And they brought their kids. So we had kids out on the football field. We had kids in the gym. I, over, I oversaw the whole thing. We had men in the church and men from the community come and coach the kids. And some of them was coaching the kids for the first time. I put all the programming together. Like, we're going to do these drills and that drills. I would open up. We'd meet in the sanctuary to start off, have a little snack or something. We were, we were in the fellowship hall. 
then they sitting there eating and that we give an overview. And here's the theme. Whatever the theme was, we talk about that. And then we put them out there, man, and coach them up. And then we bring them back in and close with the theme. We did that for three days. Right. They had a very success. So we started doing stuff like that at different churches, which I love. Well, you did that here. You came out. Anthony came out. Um, Bruce Crevier came out. Uh, yeah. one, one guy we got to was Corbin Bone, who played for FC Cincinnati. He came okay. out to the soccer program. We brought all those kids in three or four years. We had over 100 kids coming in, 70 to 100 kids. Yeah. Uh, and, and we baptized one one VBS on the basketball program. I, I can't remember if that's – I think that's the year you were there. You had to roll, and then Anthony came in. Yeah, yeah. You got them all wound up, and then yeah. we did the basketball program. And 22 kids gave their life to Jesus Christ in three yeah. days. In three yeah. days. We baptized them all right there on, on the spot. Man, I wish more churches would do stuff like that, right? It's a great way to get – Families involved, you know, kids want to be, a, you know, everybody say my kid going to be a pro athlete. It's a great way to get men involved. Some men that's in the church and men that don't necessarily come to church, but they'll come to see a pro athlete or play ball or touch the ball because they're going to hear it too. That's right. They're going to hear the same message, right? And, right. and and you have a huge success, man. You know, all you're doing is, all we're doing is being fishers of men, right? We just, right. We're just finding a way, man, you know. We use so, yeah. uh, basketball, soccer, and we uh, – John Love would come in and bring in stuff signed from the New York Knicks. People yeah. we met. Uh, we made sure that every kid got something in their hand to go home with with an autograph on it. Yeah, man. Baptism Amen. certificate, participation certificate. Yeah. It wasn't just that we brought kids in. We got a chance to give them to the gospel, but we did not yeah. bring them home empty-handed. You just After, said something that ahead. a lot of people – a lot of people don't agree with this. But in the world I live in, see, I give out participation trophies, right? Because I want you to know why. See, people say, oh, no, 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 anybody can participate. Yeah, but everybody doesn't. See, because I did I did um, something in the schools called the power of showing up. They like said 80% of success is just showing up. Amen. Just showing up. And you know, in the world we live in today, man, and I'm not trying to be an indictment against the society or this generation, but they're not built like we are. See, we showed up, baby. Right? You're talking about the coach, son, if you're not here, Man, they, they don't show up. So a win for them is showing up. And yeah. then some of the stuff they got to go through just to show up. And so, man, when they show up, man, you got to applaud them. And see, here's something I learned as a professional athlete. Think about the millions of dollars that professional athletes make, right? Mm -hmm. They get that. But you know what we found out? And the fans not understand this. As much money as they make, when we appreciate them and applaud and clap, they seem to play better. Yeah. Yeah. They play better. Sure. You know? Everybody wants to be affirmed. Yeah. Everybody wants to be appreciated. Everybody wants to be validated. So, man, look, show up, son. We got a trophy for you. It may be the only trophy you ever get, but you know what? It'll teach you the value of showing up. Man, listen, how'd you get that? Man, I showed up. I was just there. <laughs> what? All I got to do is show up? Yeah, show up, because you're going to learn. You can't unhear something. When they show up, then it's God's anointing, and our job is to inspire them after they show up. I can't inspire nobody if nobody's there. That's right. That's right. I tell even my kids when they go to work, they said, how do I, how can I be a good employee? I said, show up early and yep. do what they ask you to do. That's it. That's right. That's, That's it. it. And you'll be an excellent and, employee today. <laughs> see, for us, that was normal, right? Yeah. But yeah. for them, you show up and be early and you, you do what they ask you to do, you're up here. That's right. That's it. What? <laughs> yeah. Rob shows up early. What? But man, everybody showed up early. When we were coming along, my coach used to say, if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. That's true. Now, man, to get a kid to show up early and then follow directions, man, he's a super employee. He's a rock star. Yeah. Go ahead. So they may come because they see NFL. Yes. And they say, well, Ray's a superstar and all of this. But what they find out when they get there that Rob's a superstar too. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That's what they find out. No, they find that out because you're going to be there and they see that you love them and they see the consistency and they get to see the exceptionalness in you, the excellence in you. See, they may not come. We don't care why they come. I don't no. care why they come, you know, but just come because now they can be in relationship with you. Because yeah. NFL, man, they do a great job of promoting their brand. Yes. NFL player, Philadelphia Eagles, Pittsburgh, oh man, the Steelers guy going to be there. But then when they get there, and they see you there smiling and loving on them <laughs> and you know all of that kind of stuff. That's how we work together. One body, different That's parts, right. right? That's right. So anyway, we we met through Bill yeah. Sports Power International. So yeah. tell me, uh, how, when did you get involved with Bill and Sports Power International? That was probably my first event. Yeah? Was it really? <laughs> get out of town. 
And that was probably my first event. Yeah, no. with Bill. Okay. Yeah, that's probably my, my first event. I, just, I don't even know how I met Bill. I think I met Bill at an FCA event or something like that. Okay. And, um, you know, we got to talking. And, you know, Bill, he's always recruiting, man. You know oh, that. Bill Constantly. You know, and, and Bill heard me speak. Remember, I spoke at that event. Yep. You remember clap one time, clap two times? Oh, Ray was looking good. Clap one time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? I shared that at the prison this weekend. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> Dude, that is such an amazing method. I love that. Love that. You had the uh, whole yeah. crowd on every word waiting for you to say clap one time. They were clapping, weren't they? they, they were clapping. Clapping. <laughs> so I Bill Allickson started the chaplain program to the NBA, if I'm correct. Yeah. He was uh drafted by the NBA, got hurt. And then this was back in what 70s, 80s when he was playing, yeah. 70s? Yeah, yeah, 60s, 70s. Okay, 60, 70. He was a phenomenal uh, basketball player. Hartford, yeah. God. you cannot meet Bill without getting the gospel. No, no question. No, so I meet him in Baltimore in 1995 when I'm a state trooper down there, and or right before I was a state trooper. I was coming fresh out of the military, and we were talking, and I'll never forget, and I held him to this. I said, you you work with the, the NBA, you work with uh, the Boston Celtics, and then John is the chap in New York. The next. I said, yeah. listen, if I start a church, would you come out and speak sometime? And that was over 15 years prior to the moment I called him and said, you remember that promise you made me? <laughs> <laughs> and Bill, yeah. being Bill, fulfilled that yeah. promise. Yeah, yeah, that's Bill. He brought all you guys out here and did that basketball at Ryle High School here in Kentucky. Yeah, it was awesome. It was awesome. And we took every cent of that money, started the launch program, and we gave it to one of the school systems and fed, I don't know, how 400 kids for like two years. Wow. And one wow. of the things, too, that you all did, you probably didn't even know about, was after the game, the money also went to seniors that had outstanding debts that would not get their diploma because they wow. couldn't afford to pay the debt that they owed to the school. Wow. So we paid wow. on behalf of the game. Amen. Amen. So they could graduate and get their diploma. So we really, that's, that's, real, that's real, that's real ministry there. Isn't it? That was meant, not a dime of that money went anywhere, but to the children. That was a great that was, event, man. That huh? was a great event. And then if you remember, Bruce Prevy and I spoke at the prayer breakfast. Yes. You know, because nobody's doing stuff like that. See, that's no. grassroots. That's meeting people where they are. And, and again, man, I never see myself as a celebrity, but people hate to the fact that I got the NFL attached to my name. And when did they get to meet people like that? Yes. When did they, and then when they meet the people like that, we're not talking about, yeah, I caught touchdowns, man. I caught Jesus. That's right. That's what we're saying. We're not talking about, man, you should have seen what I did to him. No, man, look how Jesus changed my life. Yeah. Said, wow. You mean you played in the NFL and you're talking about Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. That's I don't Again, I don't know why more people don't do that. And actually, we'll talk about it right before we close up. So Sports Power with Bill Allickson, which was phenomenal. He's still doing that, I know. What's MAAP, Ray? That's Matt. So that's the nonprofit I started, right? Okay. So um, I got saved in prison. I come home, right? And when I come home, man, I'm saved. So now the old lifestyle, the crack, all that stuff is gone, right? I got to find something to do. So I meet this guy, and he asks me, do you ever heard about the Fellowship of Christian Athletes? I'm like, no. I never really heard of no Christian anything. And so um, six months after I was saved, after I came home from prison, I was in full-time ministry. Wow. Right. I started the Fellowship of Christian Athletes in Baltimore. Okay. Went great. My job was to set up Bible studies in schools. And um, so, you know, it was great. Things were going pretty decent. But um, then I came off a 20-year crack habit, and I needed money. True. Right? And I went to them, and I asked them for a raise. And they said, well, you're the highest-paid FCA guy in the country. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Said, <laughs> I said, man, that's great, but I need more money. <laughs> and, and, and and so they, they basically said, uh, they said no. Okay. And so I started MAP, Mentoring Academics, Athletics, and Partnership. And so that was my first time having my own 501c3. My first time having, having uh, now I got my own board. Now we're doing sports ministry, really. We're doing an after-school program. Okay. And we started doing it in, in one of the roughest schools in Baltimore. And, uh, and God had gave me a vision that we would have 100 kids um, in this after-school program set up as a basketball league, but we teach the gospel, and we did. So we had 100 kids. The first year, 80 of them gave their life to Christ, and um, it just grew, man. It grew from that to um, we went from one school to five schools. So now 
in the course of every week, we were ministering to 500 kids a week. Is that what you, you know? do now? So, yeah, we still have it now. Okay. And then I started um, something very similar to Sports Power, something called Shooting for Peace, yep. where we do celebrity basketball games. We do summer camps. We do after-school programs. But we do sports ministry. We share the gospel. You know, that's what we do. We we use sports as a carrot. You know, the vacation Bible school. Yes. All of that stuff we do. But what we do is we say, hey, man, <laughs> come and learn how to play basketball. Come and learn how to play football. Come and meet these pro athletes. And, oh, by the way, we're going to talk about the Bible. Is that okay? Sure, I don't care that. And, 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 you know, bring your brother, bring your sister, bring your teacher, bring your mother, bring your father. And so that's what that's what I've been doing. Of course, you know, I'm ordained. I've been preaching. I've been a youth yeah. pastor for 13 years, yep. you know. So, you know, this – just doing, you know, what God's called me to do. You're doing it. How did you meet? Uh, I still talk to John Sheeran. You still talk to John so, at all? Yeah, so John replaced me. Okay. So I was a youth pastor at the church. And then, so I was at I was at a church called Mount Pleasant in Baltimore, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. So I, I was a youth, that's where he is now. Yeah. So I was a youth pastor there for seven years. So I'm literally traveling the country speaking for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I'm doing this all this other stuff, right? So I felt like God was calling me out of the church. So I went to the uh, pastor and I said, hey, man, uh, you know, I'm going to resign. I said, but when I resign, I already got somebody that can replace me, John Sharon. Oh, good and man. So, and John Sharon grew up in that church. Hey, really? And so I said, man, if I were you, I would hire this guy, right? Yeah. And so um, so he hired John Sharon when I left. And then I left and then um, I go and preach at Brooklyn Tabernacle and they hire me as a youth pastor up in New York. Wow, so, Yeah. <laughs> It was crazy. You're a man in demand, Ray. <laughs> it was crazy, man. It just by the grace of God. Uh, the FCA. You said you worked for. You were the main spokesman for the FCA for years. I'm in Cincinnati. My buddy Nate Salee is the head of the FCA here in Cincinnati. I think he took over from a failing, and I'm not sure, but I think it was like really struggling. But Nate's taking it to another level here locally. Mm -hmm. You worked for that. How long were you with the FCA? So I was with FCA. So I, I was the director for FCA for what, like? Two or three years. Right after I got saved, I started FCA in Baltimore. Okay. Then I resigned and started MAP, M-A-A-P, right? I started MAP. And I had MAP going for like two or three years, and then FCA asked me to be their national spokesman. So I was the national spokesman for them for like 10 years, where I traveled around the country speaking in the schools. Outstanding. That's where I developed the clap once, clap twice, <laughs> all of that stuff. Um, because I'm I'm speaking to school. I'm, 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 doing, I'm speaking 100,000 kids a year. That's awesome. You know? So, you know, I'm, I'm doing that. And then, and then during that time is when I also got the job at Brooklyn Tabernacle. Yes. Right? And so, um, you know, I was loving that, man. I was there for three years at, at Brooklyn Tab, man, with Pastor Simler and all of that stuff. I came back and uh, I resumed MAP and we started doing the after-school program. But we had already been doing after-school programs. But we started okay. doing summer camps. And here's something that we do, man, I love. So we do these one-day sports clinics, right? I love those one-day clinics because they three or four hours, you know? Yeah. And so... It, it, it's a great way to uh, introduce people to sports ministry, to bring people together, and it, it doesn't require a lot of time. Okay. All right, let me give you some quotes that I learned from Ray. You ready? <laughs> uh -oh. I got a few. Here's one. Give the devil a black eye. Yes, sir. You know, man, I adopted that. Okay. <laughs> Everything I do, I'm like, I'm going to give the devil a black eye today. Yeah, man. And that's, uh, I know sometimes, as you know, ministry can be very challenging. Yeah. When you step forward, I've I've found that man, like nine things will come against you very quickly. Yeah, yeah. But every time I come against that challenge, I want to say thank you, Ray. Or say, <laughs> okay, devil, you just hit me hard, but I'm gonna give you a black eye tomorrow. That's right. So that's, that's right. One. Here's one, and this I put on face on my YouTube as a thing. It's the number one hit motivational saying that I have on the Spilling My Beans channel. <laughs> if it's God's will, He'll pay the bill. That's right. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. That's right, man. That's it. <laughs> That's right. And then the, the one that you always say, this is one of your cores, I know, is um, what God meant for good. What, what the devil meant for evil, God meant for good. Yeah. I If you want to speak into that one, you use that a ton, and I think that's very I powerful. Do. Well, because, I mean, it's my testimony. Mm -hmm. Remember I told you earlier, you know, like the thing I, I got kicked out of NFL for using drugs, man, you know, just not being a good person. And 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 that's the I mean, that's why they call me wherever I go now. And people say, man, you know, I heard you smoke crack and you should do this and you should do that, but you don't do it anymore. So the worst time of my life, my story for his glory. 
Amen. You know? I like and that. And so, um, you know, that's what he does, man. So I go in and, and like I was, I was telling the inmates this weekend, I was like, man, you know, um, winning don't always look like winning. You know, I didn't realize, man, that when I was going, when I went to jail and I was looking at that jail, I didn't know I was winning. It saved my life. It changed my life. It was a defining moment. Had that not happened to me, I might still be out there. Right. Because I went to jail, because I was broken, because I hit my rock bottom, then I could hear God, you know? I could hear God, man. And so, you know, the devil wanted to use that to destroy my life, but God has used that to save lives. Hey, man, look at Ray Sidnor, man. He smoked crack for 20 years. He did this, that, and the other. But I delivered him. He was my son. And at his worst moment, he cried out. You know, the Bible said this man, poor man cried out, and God heard my cry. And because he heard my cry, he can hear your cry. So cry out to God, man. And, and I mean, I, I mean, I live by that. I tell my wife that. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I tell my wife, because we all go through challenges, man, we got challenges even today. But Absolutely. I told my wife that 100% of our worst days on earth, God showed up. I love 100 it. 100% percent of our worst days, he's always showed up. Amen. Yeah. I, I always say God dwells in our thick darkness. That's very scriptural. And we do. I think it's common amongst people that see guys like you, uh, you know, as big as you are, with your story of being in the NFL and now being a pastor, oh, he's got it all together. And yeah. as a pastor, people think, oh, Rob's got no problems. He's, yeah. they have no idea we go what we go through. And then see the, diff the beauty of you and I, though, we share that with people. Yeah. It's embarrassing sometimes. It's painful. It hurts. Yes. But you know what? People can connect with us because people see people standing in the pulpit wearing the tag of pastor, and they think, man, we, we are God's people. But that don't mean God don't see some. They don't mean God don't stretch us like you said. See, sometimes people be like, "The devil tested me," but see, it's maybe not the devil testing. Maybe it's God preparing us. Yeah. Oh you yeah. Know? Yeah. It's because a lot of times we look at we're blaming the devil. The devil tests me. No, God's preparing you for something great. You know, you got to go through to get through, right? And so I like we go that. through, man, and and then next thing you know, we get to the other side and we're prepared. Now, now I can stand in the pulpit with a clean heart. Now yeah. I can talk with integrity. You know, man, I can help that like the brother, the brother was in jail this weekend, man. And he he been in there 51 years. He'd been in locked up since he was 17 years old. That's haunting me. That's horrible. <laughs> Blew me away. And I'm sitting there and I'm talking to him. And not only was he encouraging me, but I could encourage him. <sighs> because I was like, brother, listen, man, God is using you. If you let him, he wants to use you. So now when people hear, because because I was talking to one guy and the guy said, man, I've been locked up for 30 years. And he said, that, oh, man, you're a short time. I said, what does that mean? He said, I've been locked up 51 years. Oh, my oh. gosh. I mean, I don't want I don't really think we need to know what he did. But come on, man. I mean, I don't I don't know. But to be in your your whole life for a decision you made at 17 years old, and I'm not going to again, I don't know. And I'm not going to discount anything. But literally, yeah. that's that just that's haunts me. That's tough, man. But you know, and so man, we bonded though. We talked because see again, like you, man, you like me, man. I'm gonna keep it real. Yeah. You know, I say, hey man, I get it. I can't even imagine that. No. But I guarantee you, God can use it. That's what I told him. That's right. I said, God can use that, bro. I said, so man, I don't I, you know, I don't know when you're getting out. He said, Yeah, I'm coming home soon. I got five more years. Oh, you know. So man, he'll be in jail for 56 years. He's gonna be 70. And he said, I got I said, but listen, man, when you come home. And you stay with God, I'm telling you right now, you'd be surprised what God would do for you. And I told him, I said, man, I'm in Gatesville, Texas. Bro, I ain't never heard of no Gatesville, Texas, but God had this in his plan. <laughs> you know? know? Yeah, I do. Oh, my <laughs> gosh, that's incredible. You know what? Some men didn't do their greatest things till they were over 60, 65. Yeah. I'm, some I'm of the greatest. one of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm 55, so, you know, I, you know, look how long it took me to really grab a hold of what God wanted for me. And, I, I mean... I, I would have never called me to be a pastor. I know me. I'm yeah. you know, no. yeah. I wouldn't yeah. do that. But for some reason, yeah. God decided yeah. to take this lump of clay and whatever, a worm. I'm, I'm a worm. I always say, I'm, I'm no better than a worm. But I will say, I, I'm glad that God made this worm. So I'll take Amen. it. Amen. <laughs> me too. So then um, I got one more quote. And this is the first time you ever scared me, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> and you and I had talked about me being in a, as an army ranger, as a, as a medic in special forces and all the stuff that I did. It was fun. And I did enjoy it very much. <laughs> it's amazing how sports walks with the military so closely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and having that mentality that you're invincible for so many years. And we were talking <laughs> about that. 
<laughs> and we, we walked. This is uh, 25 years after I was in the Ranger Battalion. And we walk into a restaurant. You tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, you said, <laughs> I'm sorry. How's it feel to know we're the baddest dudes walking in this place? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute. That was 20 years ago, man. Yeah. <laughs> Same six, nine, you are. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still beating down some of my flesh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Isn't that something? You know, Paul even said that. Who's going to save me from this this wretched body that I live in? You know, and by the grace of God, I I pray. I said, you know, we're never going to die, Ray. We're going to lay this body down. Yeah, we'll be alive somewhere, and God's going to deliver us even from this body we're in. Yeah, yeah. We, He gave it to us. We can. It's our tool to be used for His glory. But how many of us really do what we're really capable of? And I can't wait for the day, honestly, when this is ripped out. And yeah. I, I was teaching on Mark 12 today when Jesus was uh, confronted by the fair, the Sadducees that don't believe in the afterlife and they don't believe in uh, angels. And their yeah. scriptures were the Pentateuch. Yeah. And, and he said, when we are resurrected, which they don't believe, of course, Acts yeah. 3 talks about that, we will be like the angels, which they don't believe in. Yeah. And you don't even know Moses because in Gen in uh, Exodus 3, uh, 14, 15, 16, around there, he says, I'm the God of the living, not the God of the dead. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah, yeah. And they're alive. That's what he said. Yeah. They're not yeah. dead yet, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, wow, we're going to be transformed one day, man. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So anyway, so I this is this is one thing. The, this is the final thought. This is my closing. I wrote this out because I wanted to be very specific on this. Um, I remember you saying many times, um, I don't know who I am when you were young. You were being yeah. what you were. Yeah. Uh, number two, you were an All-American. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know what? I, I've heard guys say I'm an All-American. What does that actually mean? So, so when I was in high school, I was an All-American in two sports, right? And football and basketball. What that meant was that all the high school basketball players in the whole country, I was considered one of the best in the country in both sports. Wow. I was at the elite of the elite. And the same thing in college. I'm an All-American at Wisconsin as a tight end. So I was an elite of the elite. Okay. All-American. That's what All-American is. All right. I'm writing this down. I got this. Uh, so you don't know who you are. You were yeah. All-American. We've talked about this. There was times when you thought you were the man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I don't like, but I'm bringing it up. I'm bringing it up because you brought up. You yeah. used to say I was a crackhead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I don't like that one, Ray. I don't like that one. But I know you too well. <laughs> yeah, it's past now. It's, yeah, it's past. past. I, don't, I don't like that one. Um, You were the steal of the draft. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. said that even today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then you were the baddest man in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you know me well. <laughs> I know you will, man. I know you will. So this is, I got two final questions for you. This is one. Who is Ray today in Christ Jesus? Well, I, I tell everybody I'm, I'm Patricia's husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know who the boss is. <laughs> yeah, no question about that. You know, you know, I, you know, to be honest with you, you know, I mean, I, I know who I am today, right? Number one, right? You know, um, uh, and I like that script at 1 Corinthians 3, 16, know you not, you're the temple of God, and the spirit of God dwells in you, right? So I know who I am today. But that's what I say. You know, uh, all I, all I want to be, all I, want, I just want to be God's servant. That's it. I love it. Some of all those things to being a servant. You don't know who you are. You're a, uh, an all-American, the steel of the draft, the baddest man in the room. You've been promoted to servant. Amen. Amen. <laughs> there you go. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Me too, what man. A privilege. Hey, man, I want to crawl up the stairway to heaven with you one day. Yeah. Stay on God's office floor, wherever that may be, and just be 100% exhausted. Yeah. I got love that. that. I love I that. Yeah. <laughs> so, I love that, question. Man. I told you I had two questions. Yeah. Uh, you're doing a lot of things. And I'm, I'm telling, and I know people don't know me that well, but people that do know that when I say, uh, it means something. And so I am proud of you and proud of knowing you. I'm glad that God put us together. You're doing a lot of things for the kingdom of God. And so I think I would like to see a lot of people benefit from that. So my question to you, and if you want to share, this is up to you. 
Mm -hmm. How do people get in touch with you to bring you? And I'm, this ain't free because you ain't doing, I mean, right. you, you do what you want with that. But how do people get in touch with you to have you come speak at their school, their event? How, how do we do that? So, I mean, I always give my phone number. So one thing about, like, you know, um, it's funny. So, you know, um, Pastor Rob, I give my phone number out all the time. And I've, I've been blessed by it. I'm not talking about speaking engagements. You know, I just went to the restroom just now, right? So, you know, I have three or four restroom runs in the middle of the night. You got to go. And, um, and so one, one night, man, I went to the restroom at three in the morning. And I took a look at my phone. And it was ringing. I didn't know it because I had it on sound. I answered the phone. It was a little girl calling me from West Virginia oh. saying, help, Ray. I want to kill myself. Oh, man. And I'm so glad that I gave her my phone number because she wanted to kill herself. She said, I heard you speak. You gave me your phone number. You said I could call you at any time. And she said, uh, I'm calling you right now. I need help. I want to kill myself. And uh, I was able to talk to her. And it wasn't what I said. It was the fact that I was available. Right. You know, it was the fact that I was available. Three in the morning, man, what's the chances of that? I answered the phone. Yeah. By the grace of God, that was God's plan. And I was able to talk to her. And I was able to get her to go get her parents. You know, because I tell her, I gotta tell your parents. Uh, she ain't want to tell us, I got you. I'm all the way up here. Mm. You know, that's the only way I can really help you. Yeah. And the parents, and then we we got close, man. So, you know, I give out my phone up. Yeah. You know, and if somebody wants to use it, and, and I, you know, you know, I, I speak for a living. That's what I do. I mean, I speak for God, but that's how I take care of my family. And so if somebody wants me to come, I tell people all the time, you know, it's a mission over the money, man. It's, it's not about money. God makes sure right. I, I got what I need. But if somebody wants me to come speak, I, I can get my number if you don't mind. That's go ahead. Yeah, it's 443-252-5519. 443-252-5519. And I can tell you, I can honestly promise you this. I may not always answer the phone when you call, but when I get the message, I'll call you back. Outstanding. And you know what? That's how many kids in this world don't have somebody to pick up the phone. Yeah, I mean, that's powerful. Yeah. So it's awesome. You see, there's the number. If you guys want to get a hold of Ray, invite him out to speak at your event. I'm telling you, I've been and seen him four or five times. We've been friends for 12, 15 years now. You won't regret it. And if you do take a love offering, be generous. Um, is, if anybody wants to donate to your ministry, can they do that online or anything? Well, we, we don't have a way online right now because actually our website, I got a meeting on Thursday. As a matter of fact, our website's under construction. But okay. I mean, you know, we're working out. You call me, we're working out. But I, I want to say something before I go. Yes, sir. Man, I appreciate you. Appreciate you. Know, you. I, 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 I mean, you know I'm telling you, man, we connected from day one. Mm -hmm. You know, when we first met, man, we we just connected, man. You know, um, we, we have like spirits, right? We just want to, we just want to, as a kid said, we just want to see people live their best life. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. all we want, man. <laughs> we just want to see people live their best best life, and it, it's not about us. Because you're like me in this regard. When I see you live your best life, I get something out of it. Yeah, you know, I get something out of it. We don't do it to get anything out of it, but we do get something out of it because there's a lot of joy in it, right? The world is a better place. So, man, you and your family, man, I'll never forget. You know, we down there, man. Y'all bless me. Y'all always bless me. And when I'm Facebook friends with every all your whole family anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the kids so, don't know. It. They just think you're Uncle Ray, man. <laughs> yeah, because I am. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, man, I, I just want you to know, man, I appreciate you. And thank you again, man, for spending this time with me. Yes, sir. Th Ray, I thank you for taking the time. I know you're busy, very busy. I'm grateful. You know what? I'm grateful. A lot of people know you call me once in a while just to check on me. Yeah. yeah. And, and that blows me away. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Please. You will not regret it. Call Ray, have him come out and speak and clap one time and you'll you'll be clapping. <laughs> you'll be clapping a thousand times when he gets done speaking. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's Amen. Rob. Love you, man. And God bless you. Yeah.